So, like I said, this is the first uh, message, the first chunk. The book of James is several chapters. We've been breaking, like, the summer we flew through uh, Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 and 2, you know, look, talking at David. This fall, we're going to take chunks of this um, these chapters and spend a, a little time each week talking about them. And then also Kevin will have emails every day going out about this. And also like our youth Bible studies are focusing on this. And the, so I want to encourage you to engage with this material um, repeatedly um, over this season, because I think it's something that God wants us to look at, learn from, and, uh, and understand in this day. And I'll give you some background here. And I think you'll understand the application. Uh, a little bit of basic, basic background, just so we're in the same thing. Like, we just went through the book of Jude, and Jude was Jesus' brother, like actual brother, grew up in the same house brother. And James is also, the, the author of this book, is also the, uh, one of Jesus' brothers, like actual brothers. And if you, if you go and Google that stuff, there are people that think, well, maybe not, but just about everybody agrees that this is Jesus' brother. However, his name isn't James. That's like the English version. His name is Jacob, more than likely, almost it, like certainly Jacob. And so sometimes I might refer to him as Jacob because that's his. That's the guy who wrote the book. Which is we kind of changed his name as they, you know, English size everything. Um, he's Jesus' brother. He was also, and so his audience, his primar- primary audience, is Jewish believers throughout the area. And he's addressing a situation they're finding themselves in, kind of specifically, which I think we can really relate to. What's going on is their early church. They found faith in Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, and now they found themselves kind of in a strange position where they're kind of ostracized by the Roman people around them because the claim of Jesus as king is a threat to Caesar. Like, the, like you're just second-class citizens already. We don't even care for this. And they're cut out of some of the businesses. But now also, because they've got a faith in Jesus, they're also cut out of what there was their community, of the greater Jewish community. So these people are getting frustrated, and they're stuck in a place where you no longer fit in to any of the world around you. Can anybody relate to that? You know, faith in Jesus in our day and age doesn't always garner you a whole lot of acceptance in the greater society. I mean, honestly, we can really closely relate to this because these people aren't being persecuted, persecuted like fed to the lions type stuff that he's talking about, right? They're being cut out of business deals. They're being left out of things. They're, it's like a low-level persecution, the kind of thing that we actually might could relate to in our country. Like most of us aren't being arrested. You know, that is happening in the world. It, does, it did happen, and it will happen through whole, the whole history of the church. The primary part, people of this audience, the, the primary audience of this book, though, were just having a harder time in life because of their faith in Jesus, okay? And I think we can totally relate to that. You know, nowadays in our country, if you're, you're, you come out as a Christian, it, you know, people just assume you're a bigot or you, you're, you're, you know, there's all this kind of stuff. And I don't have to remind you guys, we live here. So I, the reason I think this book, <laughs> you can see immediately, I was like, oh, well, I mean, it would be really good to know what this book is about. And what he really does is, as Jesus' brother is, he kind of takes a lot of Jesus' teachings. I even saw one commentary say there's no letter in the New Testament that has as many of Jesus' teachings per page as the book of James. So what he's doing is he's taking things Jesus said, like, taught his whole life, like out in the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, and all these different things. And then he's packaging them and repackaging them for application in a life where your faith in Jesus is making you at odds with the people around you because of them, not because of things you're doing. You see what I'm saying? You're being repressed, <laughs> if they can make a Monty Python reference. The, uh, um, but it's not, it's not full-on persecution, right? But the tension is building, Okay. Because he's, he's, they're going, we, we didn't sign up for this. You know, like I, I signed up for Jesus being king, Jesus healing people, Jesus like raising people from the dead, signed up for that. You know, me following Jesus means take up my cross and follow you and like bad things might happen to me. This is getting, I'm getting, this is not going as I thought. You see what I'm saying? Even though as we read in John, he, he prepares everybody. He's like, this isn't a surprise, but it's just a um it is a, uh, well, okay, I want someone to come up here and read this. We're going to read this whole chunk. Somebody who reads out loud well, come quickly. We don't have time. Come quickly. Read it. Yes. Here's what I want to do. During this book of James time, we're going to read the chunks as a whole, okay? And then we're going to break them down and talk about them really quick. So 
just read till verse 18. Okay. So it's 1 through 18. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Amen. Thanks for reading. So I'm going to make a couple notes today. We're going to start doing something also is, I think it'll be on Wednesdays, we're going to put out like a little, a little podcast episode of more of the backgroundy stuff on these books. Because sometimes that context really helps you fully understand what's going on, but it can sometimes bog down if we give too much of it. Because I didn't know if you noticed too much of it during the sermon. I mean, because I didn't know if you noticed each one of these little things is like a like a proverb. It actually kind of reminds you of the book of Proverbs or maybe Ecclesiastes. It's like wisdom literature, and they're strung together, but kind of not. Like you could take one of those and think about it for a week, and then take another one. You know, they're not like part one, two, three, four. You know, and so because of that, uh, I want to add an additional like take. Keep your, keep your eyes open. We'll put something out with some additional thoughts that go along with this. Because the main theme of today, this little chunk, and I'm going to be very brief, is, is writing to people frustrated with their situation, the tensions building, and he's talking about trials and temptations. Most specifically, he's talking about trials and t- temptations that are the result of the fact that you're following Jesus. But it kind of works with all of it, right? How many of us have been through trials in life? Only some. So we're doing all right. Let's try that again. How many of us have been through trials in life? Okay, everybody. (laughs) For a second, I was like, well, I guess we don't need to go through the book of James. Everybody's okay. Trials and temptations. So the first part, this is kind of broken into two parts. And the first part is basically about trials. And um, he gives you the very basic thing. See, the, the, very, the beginning of this, J- he's right, Jacob to the 12 tribes is almost a play on words, you know, that he's writing this book. That's his initial greeting. And then he goes right into, okay, we're frustrated. You knew Jesus. You got Jesus' teachings. What is it exactly that you would, you know, want us to do in this situation they're in? And I would even say right now, 2022, United States of America, as a Christian person, I'm frustrated by the situation I find myself in, people hating me just because I have faith in Jesus. I'm frustrated by that. It annoys me that I have to, you know, be defensive all the time or feel this way. I feel this kind of feeling inside when I see people posting things online, all this kind of stuff. He's like, what's the best, the most important thing that I should do as far as my attitude or whatever? He's like, let's just start there. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. We could just stop there. That's the whole thing. So we go, yeah, but 
can't I get mad and try to fight about it? It's like, well, I mean, you, you could, but really what Jesus is inviting you to do is to consider it pure joy because you know that testing produces perseverance, not because it's fun to go through. Like, it is crazy and wrong, I would even say probably stupid, to seek out persecution, okay? That is wrong-headed. And people have done stuff like that. And the, the church has been around, and people have done some crazy things, and you can read about it. It doesn't go well when you try to, like, do that, you know? But by being a Christian in this world, as Jesus said, it will come for you. It will happen. So what attitude do we take? What, how much anger do we harbor when we're fighting against these things? He's like, no, I'm inviting you over here. Now. Consider it pure joy. Because God is still God no matter what you're going through. And he's inviting you into a different place. Mentally, spiritually, all these sorts of things. And the joy is mostly coming from what Kevin was talking about earlier today. And the, it's that joy of being lovesick, the joy of the anticipation of being with God. That changes this whole framework. You know, when you only have this to work with, and when I'm doing this little thing with my hands, what I'm meaning is, this, like, human life we all have. You know, I've got so much money, so much time, so much life to live. I want to make sure my life means something. I want to, you know, da-da-da-da. Am I getting ahead of people? Am I getting behind people? Where am I? Does anything I'm doing even matter? All those kinds of thoughts. That fits in this little sand. Let's, there's, like, a little sand castle, you know. And you can have it put it together pretty good. And it's like, okay, I'm proud of this. It looks good to other people. I'm doing better than that guy or whatever, you know. And this is how we think. And so as a Christian, we're like, can God put, like, a little flag on the top to, like, make that, you know, make it better? And God's like, I don't really care about the little sandcastle. I want to invite you over here to this completely different thing. And he goes, you're still going to be, you know, I'm, I, I, you're in this world. Like Jesus' incarnation as a man, God coming as a man, gives some meaning to this sandcastle stuff, but it changes its meaning categorically to where you don't evaluate it the same way anymore. Does that make sense? I just like made a really weird metaphor that I just made up. That wasn't in the notes. So as I'm trying to go faster, I'm making up weird stuff. There's a skip. Romans 8.28 says this. And we know in all things God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That's how you can have joy. Because it's not the end. And he's talking about perseverance here. Testing will actually, the testing we're going through will actually produce perseverance in us. It's kind of like working out a muscle. You've got to work it out to get stronger. It doesn't just get stronger because you, I don't know, you know. And it's like, this is not a new deal that James is laying out for guys. He's kind of like, rem like, remember when Jesus said that stuff at the end of the book of John that we all just read? He's like, remember that? Like, he's like, take you out of the world thing? You know, like, remember this take up your cross and follow me? Remember? Like, he's kind of saying it like that. Matthew 10, 22, you'll be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Abraham was tested. And this mature word is, like metal being refined, which you know in these other verses, you know. So like, well, what do I do about it? You know, he's like, well, you're going to need wisdom. Ask for it, you know. I'm kind of paraphrasing these scripts. You can keep them up on the screen as I'm going. Because life is hard. You're not going to always know what to do. The Bible gives us a whole lot of stuff to work with, a whole lot. And our understanding of the Bible and applying it to the Bible, you're going to run into specific situations in your life where you don't get just an A plus B equals C sort of thing. It's going to be like, Jesus said this, it seems like this, is, but I don't know exactly how I'm supposed to take that and apply it here. Because this situation is a little bit different or more complicated or whatever. You know, it doesn't always, you can't just go, what verse can you tell me so I'll know exactly how much TV I should watch? Well, it's like, well, I mean, it's not in Proverbs specifically like that. You know, but there's, you, know, you see what I'm saying? That's why you need this wisdom. And God's like, ask for it. I'm more than happy to give it. But then you read this next thing where it's like, but if you ask, you got to believe and not doubt. Because if you're doubting, you're like, you know, you shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. You're like, I don't know what that means. When I was a kid, this kind of stuff, because I have OCD, kind of freaked me out. I was like, well, I don't, I'm going to doubt anything. I'm going to pray harder or something. That's not really what he's talking about. He's not talking about like, if I ask God something, I'm like, do I think God will do this or can do this? Or, it's more a person who's trying to live the sandcastle life and want God to like put their little, I want the God stamp on it. I don't want to give it all to him, you see. I want just the stamp. I want to add a little, you know, there's a God part of my life, and then there's other parts. And he's like, if you're that kind of person, this isn't going to work. You see what I'm saying? God's wisdom doesn't work that way. Now, if you're in a true situation, because you, you truly surrender it all to God, you're still going to go through some pretty tough stuff. Actually, it will increase, I would believe. And he's like, you're going to need my help, so ask for it, and I'll give it to you. It's, 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 it's talking about that, 
a person who's really needing from God, he's going to give you wisdom, okay? But if you're wanting God to just kind of give his stamp on your little thing you're doing, it just doesn't work. And so it's not even saying, like, I won't do it. It's just like that just doesn't, it isn't possible would be a better way to even understand it. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. This is kind of where you start to see how that sandcastle thing matters, but it's changed by God. It's like the Beatitudes. If you remember the Beatitudes, blessed is, you know, J Jesus is in those statements changing the way we see the world. And then he makes kind of a, a play on words again. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation because they were going to pass away. So he's making this thing that we don't need to worry so much about our status anymore. Actually, you don't need to worry about it at all. And we worry about it a lot. You know, you go, well, I don't care what car I have. There's something. You know what I'm saying? And he's saying, we don't need to do that anymore. I'm inviting you to not live that life anymore. And that, frankly, sounds awesome. And there's this, uh, but the thing about this rich is just so you know, this is a good thing to stick in here. When he's not saying it's bad for Christian people to have money or anything like that. He's talking about people who put their faith in their money specifically, right? Because, in, and this might be podcast stuff, but it's about the words they're using to describe rich versus, because there's Greek words that they're using different words. You know, later he talks about believers that have, you know, so it's referring to non-believers, believers in money. Let's just call it that. But like that prayer we pray every week, our culture is definitely believers in money, okay? So we've got to work that out of our thinking. So we move on to the second part, temptations. And you find this word blessed. Uh, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, having stood the test. That person will receive a crown of life the Lord has promised to those who love him. And... Uh, So it's kind of this inevitability of the temptations that are coming in life. And, but this word blessed is, again, it's only from God's perspective. And only from God do we receive this crown. Craig Keener said this, to ancient readers, his words could proclaim, testing, testings are not the result of arbitrary fate. Our likes are the, the fateful workings of a loving father. It's good to remember this because, you know, God's role in our lives. Because we're going to experience testing. And you could be like, did I, why, what did I do to deserve this? Has anyone ever thought that? Or why did this happen to me? Not the right question. You know, and I'm not even going to say that there, those questions don't always answer, have answers. I'm just saying that, like, you know, it's, it's leading you down into this way of thinking, not into God's way of thinking. God is you the, the trust in God, like the one when you ask for wisdom, is saying that I don't know why I'm experiencing this. And even if God could tell me in his infinite wisdom, I probably wouldn't be satisfied with that answer or still be okay with it. I might be like, yeah, I'd still rather not. But what you say is like Jesus praying in the garden, not my will, but yours be done. That's it, the whole thing. Remember, we are talking to Jude about you know, forsaking our place. It's knowing that God is good. And that he can take care of us in spite of the things we're going through. And then he reminds us, like, you know, don't go off saying this is God tempting you, though. Because God doesn't tempt anybody. That's, that's kind of referencing back to, you know, when the Israelites were in the wilderness, which is a picture of this whole thing. And they start to question, God, like, why did God do this? And why is God doing that? Like, did he bring us out here to die? It's like that kind of thing. We start questioning God at that point. We think we're just talking about our own lives. You know, why did this happen to me? What did I do to deserve this? What did, you know, and really what you're saying is, why did you do this to me? Why did you let this happen to me? It's kind of a worse version of that same story. And we don't have the position to ask God. We can't, as human beings, that's the picture in the book of Exodus you see. It's not our place to question God like that. And when that happens... He doesn't like it. And then God, God he wants to remind you, he's like, even this idea, like you're going to go through bad things. Sometimes it's like tempting. Tempting is testing or trial. It's all the same sort of word. You're dragged away by your own evil desires. And after the desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. He's like, don't even blame. In this, he's almost saying, don't blame God for this stuff that you're doing that's wrong or that you're experiencing. He's like, and don't even necessarily blame the devil. He's like, you do a lot of these things. That's why I'm saying 
a lot of this has not this isn't talking about like bad things you experience you're in an accident or something like that. It's not mostly talking about that. It's talking about situations you find yourself in in life, you know. Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift, this is where he's saying, like, let me remind you what God is like, okay? Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we may be the kind of first fruits he created. So God is a giver of gifts. He's the one who's taking care of us. So, Kayla, come on up here. This is the conclusion. James is giving us a rundown of how to apply Jesus' teaching to our lives when we're living in a situation that's not friendly to faith in Jesus, which is certainly where we live in the United States right now. These mostly Jewish believers were experiencing the type of trials that were not severe, like low-level persecution, social rejection, economic boycotts, things like that. And they were leading many people to want to revolt violently And James is challenging this directly and encouraging a different approach. He's saying, that's not Christian. This is. We can be deceived into thinking that following Jesus will bring us only wealth, comfort, maybe fame, and even other weirder things. And it's just not really necessarily part of the equation. There are people like that is going to happen in some people's lives. But that's not the math problem. It's not like insert your Jesus token and take out the bucket of, you know, fame and money that you all get from it you know that's just not how it works you say like i'm giving you my life and then you're going to do what you're going to do with it you know what i mean he's but we can trust him because he's the giver of the good gifts i'm reading what i'm skipping So the end is this. It's not the if you're going to go through hard things. It's you are. And it's not how do I make that just stop? What's the way that I can make this stop so that I don't feel like that anymore? There are times in our lives where you go through seasons. This is not a totally universal thing. There's horrible things that happen in our lives And you see, like, when Jesus is encountering people and he gives freedom to demon-possessed person. He's not like, when you go through this, just know I'll be with you. Like, so there are times when God enters our lives and categorically changes everything, you know, and that is what happens at salvation. But then, like Jesus coming to us, he sends us back. We are not of the world, but we're still in the world. And we are the light of the world to shine everywhere, the salt and light that we're required by Jesus to be. And when you start doing that, you're rubbing against the world and things that are uncomfortable start happening because of that. And you have this temptation inside yourself to fight. And then what you end up doing is hurting people. And Jesus has to heal them too because of the things you're doing. And a better way to look at this as he's framing this book of James is giving us Jesus' teaching applied to our lives, and especially this one today, considering it joy. I don't quite see that sometimes. I don't see the joy in all the bad things I'm going through. I'm telling you right now, I don't usually see it. It's like you got to remember that. It's a good thing this book's in here. It's like, this is really crap, and I don't enjoy it very much, you know. And he's like, well, consider it joy. I was like, well, okay, I guess, you know. Then you have to remember something like this. This is this phrase, the fellowship of suffering. Philippians 3, 10 and 11 says this, I want to know Christ. Right? Who wants to know Christ? I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. That is a crazy verse. Did you hear what I said? Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. And we're like, cool. <laughs> and the participation in his sufferings. What are you talking about? See what I'm saying? At these times, the suffering. Jesus is inviting us into this fellowship of suffering. Not without him. It's because that's where he is. It's where he always is. It's where he's going to be until the second coming. As long as there are things that aren't right, that's where he's going to be. And he's inviting us to go with him. It's an invitation. When we're going through these things, it's not because 
God has abandoned us, it's because we're there with him. And he's saying, to, he's saying, I can trust you enough to have you deal with this. Because I know you won't turn your back on me. I need someone to go. But I can trust you. I'm like, it's not fun though, God. He's like, I know. I've been there. I'm there now. I'm with you. I'm going to close by reading this. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 10. So I think it kind of paraphrases the same stuff in a different way. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. Through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine, yet regarded as imposters. I'm going to just read this again. Through glory, which we like, and dishonor, which we don't like. Through bad report and good report, we're genuine, yet we're regarded as imposters. Known, yet regarded as unknown. Dying, and yet we live on. Beaten, and yet not killed. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, yet making many rich. Having nothing, and yet to possess everything. This is what Jesus is inviting you to do as his followers. It's not humanly possible. It doesn't even make sense. That's why Paul, that's why he's laying out all these different <laughs> examples, because they don't make sense if all you're going to talk about is your little sandcastle thing. If you give God that, he could change everything into something else. And if you need a reminder of how far that can go, you need to always just remember the cross of Jesus Christ. We are talking about this is God himself, God coming as a man, a human being, which is already crazy enough. And then our response to that is to kill him because we can't handle it, which is the same thing we've always done since the beginning of time. He's like, let's try to kill God and take over or whatever, you know. You go, well, that's about as bad as it can get. God's here as a man and we killed him. It's about as bad as it can get. And I'm telling you, that is as bad as it can get. You can't get any worse than that. So nothing you've done or anything, you know, that's as bad as it gets. And then God had predetermined before all time that that was how he was going to save the whole world. So God can use anything for good. So when we're facing the anythings, remember, he's not talking about it as a person who doesn't know what he's, he's experienced. It. So, Father, I pray that we would have the courage to be invited into your fellowship of suffering. And we wouldn't back down just because it's uncomfortable. We would surrender to all of these teachings as a whole and individually, Lord. That we would ask for wisdom. We would trust you. We would give you our lives. That we would consider it joy when we go through hard things. We know that you're not the one doing bad things to us. You're not tempting us to do bad things either. You are the giver of good gifts. And I pray that we would live lives in this world of darkness with the light that reflects that to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we just stand? I'm going to pray for the food, and we're going to, do you have something to sing? No, let's just, let's just close and have lunch. How about I say that? There is one other thing. The third table over here is a little janky, so don't use that one. I left the umbrella down as a marker. We have to repair that.
So, Lord, bless this time together as families, as a church family. We pray that you would bless each of us that's here. We pray that you bless the food that we're going to eat. We pray that you would fill this place with your presence in fellowship. And we pray for your love to abound in all of our hearts towards each other and towards you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have children in Maranatha Kids, please go pick them up. And if you need prayer, we'll be available down here to pray for you over the next few minutes.